Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Cameron Bracey's YouTube channel. I am so excited to be joining you all this evening. Um, we are in a series called, Is It a Sin? Again, the series is called, Is It a Sin? Um, last time we went into, Is Pride a Sin? And we learned so much together just about pride, the different types of pride, what pride leads to, how pride hurts us. And I know that each and every one of you who watched that video, who shared that video, were blessed and were truly impacted by that message. So I wanna welcome you, if this is your first time to the channel, I wanna welcome you to the community, to the family. Um, we are a loving channel, you know, our mission here is to tell the truth without compromise. And my goal is to honestly see our culture and the generation before us and the generation behind us. Um, I want to see them all live zealously for God. I want to see them be on fire for God like never before. So the purpose of this channel is for each and every individual uh, to live their lives for God and to live for God through the truth. And that is through Jesus Christ and Christ alone. Um, so today we are continuing our uh, our series, Is It a Sin? Again, it is called, Is It a Sin? And um, today's topic is sensitive. Um, it is a topic that I had to pray over uh, many, many times. I had to let God speak to me, reveal to me how he wants me to go about it. Um, it's a topic in which many people today, um, you know, I'm not just going to say ministers, but many people today, they avoid it all together. And I just don't believe that it is a topic that we should necessarily avoid. This is a topic that should be spoken about, um, that many people in the church, both in the church and outside the church have questions about. And it is important that it is addressed um, in a godly manner, um, not in, not to judge anyone, not to condemn anyone. Um, but these uncomfortable conversations, they bring a life changing convictions. And that is the that we can even say that is our motive in this throughout this series. You know, I want your heart to be changed. I want you to experience Jesus. I want you to repent. I want you to turn away. If you've been a slave to sin, I want you to break every single chain. I want God to break every single chain. And I want you to be delivered from that slavery, that life of slavery to sin. Uh, so today's topic we are talking about abortion. Now, remember I told you all at the beginning of the series that these there are going to be topics that we're going to talk about throughout this series. So throughout the month of January and most likely throughout the month of February, we're going to talk about things that um, may not be so publicly spoken of, but that does not mean it should not be spoken about. Um, you know, one thing as I've been studying my word this week and as I've been reading, you know, Jesus had those uncomfortable conversations um, in, in the New Testament. God had those uncomfortable conversations with, with his prophets in the Old Testament. So it is important that as men and women of God today that we have these uncomfortable conversations, both with the older and the younger generation, because these are conversations that, again, are going to bring life changing convictions and they're going to uh, better us and, and, and take us to another level um, in our relationships with God. So before we get into the scripture, before we get into the topic, um, you all know that we start off every single video, every single message with a prayer. So we're going to bow our heads and we're going to close our eyes. Heavenly Father, um, I pray that you just use me to minister. You use me as your vessel to bless someone this evening, to bless a young lady who may be thinking about abortion, to bless a young lady who may be um, pressured to getting an abortion, oh Heavenly Father. There may be a young lady out there who is going, I don't know if I'm going to be able to take care of this child. I don't know if I, if I want this child. This isn't how I plan my life to be. But Lord, I pray that this message changes their perspective, that this message reveals to them that your plan always works together for the good. Um, I know this is a tough a tough topic, a sensitive topic, but Lord, I just pray that you give us wisdom regarding this topic. You give us wisdom regarding this message and that this message reaches so many throughout many nations and many tribes. So we love you and we praise you, Jesus. Thank you for allowing us to commune with one another tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, O oh Lord. Amen and amen. Um, so tonight, Again, the topic of tonight's sermon is, is it is, is abortion a sin? I apologize. 
is a is abortion a sin you can write that down in your notepad and your notebooks and your ipad um wherever it is you keep track of your notes um the title of tonight's sermon is is abortion a sin now i'm going to start off with the definition of abortion um i pulled this uh definition directly from uh cdc um, an abortion is identified as a procedure to end or terminate a pregnancy by removing the embryo or fetus um, and when it is an abortion, um, when they remove the baby from the womb of the mother, uh, this should not result in a live birth. The baby should not be alive. So uh, these aborted procedures are to remove, again, an embryo or fetus or terminate or end a pregnancy by removing the em embryo or fetus from the womb. Um, just two stats that I wanted to share before we get into scripture tonight. Um, in 2019, I tried to pull 2020s. Um, 2020 stats were not available, at least not from uh, websites that I considered reputable. But in 2019, um, women in their 20s accounted for 59.6% of all abortions, again, according to the CDC. Um, you may go, well, Cameron, how, how, how many was that out of how many abortions? Um, overall, there the CDC reported, or it was reported to the C CDC, um, in 2019 that there were over 600,000 abortions that were reported again that is over 600,000 um abortions that were a point uh, reported and 59.6 percent of those so basically almost 60 percent um almost 60 percent of all abortions in 2019 were uh by women in their 20s um, I know when I saw that stat, it broke my heart. Um, like I said, this topic is very sensitive, but it is a conversation that needs to be had. Um, I have been praying that maybe we can even all have a, a Zoom conversation just about it, just so that I can hear a little bit more about your story, about your testimony. Maybe you can share something with me or share something with another la or another young lady or another man who's trying to understand, like, hey, why does this go on? Is it appropriate? You know, um, and it's just heartbreaking i know there are many reasons uh why a woman may end up choosing to get an abortion um i know that amongst the church there are some that they find to excuse and there are others that they go that's not an excuse to get an abortion um i do have my stance uh, my stance is honestly rather biblical um just in a manner of uh how god um created women um, to do many things, but one of the greatest things a woman can do is honestly give birth to that child. Remember, Jesus would have never been here. Jesus would have never been able to die on the cross for us if it wasn't for Mary uh, giving birth to him. If Mary would have never accepted that calling of the Holy Spirit impregnating her to give birth to Jesus, um, we wouldn't have the salvation that we have today. So I want to start off with... Uh, you know, I, th there may be many questions, um, and I'm pretty sure as you watch this video, you may go, how is he going to go about this? You know, I don't know if I'm going to agree with everything he's saying. I started off this series honestly stating you may you may or may not disagree with, um, you may or you may agree or disagree with um, each answer that I have for these questions. So last week when the question was, is pride a sin? And after reading the Bible, after going through the scriptures, after sharing, after talking about it, we came to the conclusion that pride is a sin. It is one of, actually pride is a sin, one of those sins um, that is listed throughout many parts of the Bible that God specifically says that he detests, that he hates. Now, God hates all sin. There is not one sin that God loves, but um, there are scriptures in the Bible that actually say uh, God hates pride. Um, so today you may be going, well, is there scriptures where it says that God hates abortion? Is there scriptures that says God hates women who, who abort their babies? Um, and we're going to go in detail with that tonight. So I want to start off with uh, Psalm uh, 139. So if you want to take notes on that, we're starting at in Psalm chapter 139, uh, verses 13 through 16. Again, it is Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. And it says, you made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was 
woven together in the dark of the womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. I think this scripture is so powerful, so unique to start with. I, I purposely, uh, purposefully started off with this scripture because it starts off Psalm right here, Psalm 139 and um, verse 13. It starts with explaining how God created us, how he creating us. Um, the process started, honestly, before we were in our mother's womb. Um, you know, Jeremiah 29 and 11 is how he says he knew us before we were even in our mother's womb. We existed before a, a CAT scan saw us, before an ultrasound saw us, uh, before a doctor was able to put a Doppler on us and hear a heartbeat. Um, we existed before our mothers felt that first kick. We existed before our mothers uh, maybe felt nauseous. We existed before they felt tired and, and just kind of out of breath, all of those things. We existed before all of the physical things that take place when a woman is pregnant. Psalm 139 uh, verse 13 it starts off with, You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knit me together in my mother's womb. So that brings my first question. Cameron, is an abortion okay if, if a child, if the baby is, is six weeks or less, if the baby is only considered an embryo or a fetus? Because as you saw here by definition from the CDC, uh, it's a procedure to end a pregnancy by removing the embryo or fetus. And I want to let you know right now that just because um, medicine, just because um, scientists, they identify uh, a baby who is, uh, you know, at six weeks or of gestation or maybe even less than that as an embryo or a fetus, that does not permit us to, 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 to kill that baby. That does not permit a young lady, a young woman, a wife, a daughter, whoever it may be, it does not permit her to get rid of that baby. I know some, some science may try to make it more comforting. They may try to say, ah, the heart wasn't even developed. They may try to say, ah, the baby won't feel a thing. They may try to say, oh, you know, you'll be okay. You'll forget about it. You didn't even have a belly. I want you to know that there are women who have shared many testimonies, who remember, who, who always question what would life have been if I would have never done that. It does not matter how old the baby is. It doesn't matter how many weeks of gestation you are. It doesn't matter how far along or how early on you are in your pregnancy. Guys, an abortion is not not of God. In this manner, when we are speaking of just a woman just stating, I didn't mean to get pregnant. I didn't want to use protection. I didn't want to use any contraception. I, I, I didn't want to get pregnant. Um, I, I don't want this baby. I'm not ready. I want you to know that it is a sin when you're doing it for that reason. Now, later on in this video, I'm going to cover where the part of abortion um, where, where I'm not excusing sin, but when it comes down to the medical decision between a, a, a woman and the baby's life, um, that is a little, that's a different scenario, but I am specifically speaking of tonight, I am specifically speaking on the fact where a woman may say, I didn't want this baby. I don't want this baby. I don't feel ready. I don't, I don't think I'm old enough. This wasn't the plan that I had in life. No, this does not excuse the fact that you should abort the baby. And I know science tries to make it easy. They try to make it comforting. But let me tell you right now, there is nothing comforting about opposing God. In the moment, you may be thinking, I'm relieving myself of the shame. In the moment, you may be thinking, I'm relieving myself of the pain. But no, you are only putting yourself in opposition to God in this moment. Now, Psalm 139, 14 says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. Guys, it is unexplainable. Um, that's why today so many doctors, so many nurses, so many scientists, they have such a hard time understanding how, how the development process of a baby takes place, how, how just everything that the baby goes through and inside the woman's body, how it all goes. It, guys, that is such a complex topic. It is so so unique that 
our human our human knowledge our human wisdom it won't make sense of it this is that's why i like to say just because you don't understand it doesn't mean that it's not of god just because you can't explain it doesn't mean it's not of god i want you to know here that when when the psalmist here when he said thank you for making me so wonderfully complex he is saying lord thank you for the way that you created me your workmanship is marvelous how well i know it you are a marvelous uh, being that that little human if I, if you're watching this today you may be pregnant it may have been an unplanned pregnancy it may have happened in a way that you didn't expect it to happen i want you to know that the human being that the little child whether whether the doctor identifies it as an embryo whether the doctor identifies it as a fetus, I want you to know that that little baby that is in your belly, that is in your womb right now, he or she is marvelous. They are marvelous. They are created in God's own image. Verse 15 says, you watched me as I was being formed in utter seclusion, as I was woven together in the dark of the womb, even in those areas where it's dark. That's why I explained you may be somebody watching this today. You may, you, this may be your first time on my channel. You may have seen the topic of abortion and go, let me see what this guy has to say. He only has six views. He only has 10 views. He only has 20 views. He doesn't seem popular, but let me see what he has to say. You're watching this today and you're going, Cameron, I'm in a dark place. Cameron, I'm in a place where I, I, I feel ashamed. My family is ashamed. The father wants nothing to do with me. My friends are saying, oh my gosh, you're calling me this name and that name. How could she do this? How could she do that? I'm trying to figure out how am I going to finish school? I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to go forward. Now I'm going to move forward in my career. And I want you to know that this does not stop. This does not stop God from doing those things in your life. That little one who is being formed in utter seclusion as he, he or she is woven together in the dark of the womb. It is such a beautiful process. I remember when my wife was pregnant. I remember going to the doctor and seeing our little one, seeing Solomon just after week one, after week two, six weeks, 10 weeks, 12 weeks, 14, 16, 20 weeks. It is so amazing to see how they grow. Just the complexity of it, just the uniqueness of it. It is something that we truly cannot explain, but just because we cannot explain it does not give us the permission to abort it. And verse 16 says, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment, I, every moment was laid out before a single day had past. This is prophetic right here. You, when you read the scripture, first, the, the psalmist started off with, you saw me before I was born. God saw you. Like I said earlier on in the video, just a couple minutes ago, God saw you before they put the Doppler on you. God saw you before they were able to take images of you. God saw you before they heard the heartbeat. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Guys, every day of your life, every day of your child's life, of your baby's life has already been recorded no matter how they may have been conceived, no matter how you may be giving birth, no matter how it may have been planned or unplanned, every day of their life, just like every day of your life, has been recorded in God's book. And he finishes out this verse with, every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. That means every day, every day before you were even in your mother's womb, Every day of your life, from the from the moment that they find out that, that your mom was pregnant, from the moment that they found out you were pregnant, from the moment that they found out uh, when your child was going to be due, when you graduate, when your child graduates, and so on, every moment had already been recorded in God's book. You may be going, Cameron, how, what, what does all of this have to do with abortion? I'm trying to emphasize the the beauty of creation. I'm trying to emphasize the, the beauty of God's work, how his work, it's already recorded, how his work, it already takes place. It's already in motion before the child is in the womb. This is the beauty of creation. So you may go, Cameron, Share some scriptures with us of when um, when babies were killed or when babies were commanded to get to, to, to be thrown in the lake or just taken away and killed. Uh, and God brought me to Exodus uh, 115. Now, everybody I know, most people who read the Bible, um, I know the first scripture that they think about, the first story they think about is when Herod said that he wanted to meet Jesus. 
um, when in reality he didn't. Uh, but Herod was threatened that this baby was uh, known to someday someday be the king of the, the king of kings. Um, he was threatened, and Herod ultimately wanted to kill him. But Herod couldn't identify where Jesus was because the the three wise men were instructed by an angel to go elsewhere. Um, that's a story in itself. But anyways, Herod wanted to kill every single uh, male boy who was uh, two or younger, two or under. Um, so that story is pretty common. But I want to go to another story um, in Exodus chapter one, uh, verse verses 15 through 22. Again, that is Exodus chapter one, verses 15 and 22. And this is about Pharaoh. Um, the Israelites in this moment, just to kind of give you a brief synopsis, the Israelites were becoming great in number and uh, Pharaoh and the Egyptians began to feel threatened because they felt that if the Israelites continued to grow, they continued to expand, their numbers continued to increase, that they would someday um, become a threat to their kingdom. They would, some way, they, they would someday uh, partner with one of their enemies or combine their armies with one of their enemies, which will eventually uh, result in an overthrow of, of Pharaoh's kingdom. Um, so this was Pharaoh's solution. Let me share it with you. We're going to start off in verse 15. Then Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, gave this order to the Hebrew midwives, Shipra and Pua. I believe that's how you say their name. Forgive me for the pronunciation. But Shipra and Pua. Um, and in verse 16, Pharaoh t instructs these two midwives, when you help the Hebrew women as they give birth, watch as they deliver. If the baby is a boy, kill him. If it is a girl, let her live. But because the midwives feared God, they refused to obey the king's orders. They allowed the boys to live too. So the king of Israel, the king of Egypt, I apologize. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives. Why have you done this? He demanded. Why have you allowed the boys to live? The Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, the midwives replied. They are more vigorous and have their babies so quickly that we cannot get there in time. So God was good to the midwives and the Israelites continued to multiply, growing more and more powerful. And because the midwives fear God, he gave them families of their own. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Now, there's a lot that seems like it's going on here, but overall, basically what happened is Pharaoh, as I stated, was so threatened that he commanded these midwives, again, their names were Shifra and Pua, to, uh, to basically kill every single Hebrew boy that was, that was, going to, that was born. Um, and I want to share something with you. A lot of people don't know this. So I wanted to dig a little deeper and find out uh, what the meaning of Shifra and Pua's names were. And Shifra, it, it is assumed that her name means beauty and Pua means splendor. Isn't it amazing that the midwives that were, that were assigned to care for the Hebrew women, these two women specifically, their names meant beauty and splendor. And back then, just to kind of give you a historical uh, perspective, most midwives back in that day were midwives because they were probably unable to have a family of their own. They were probably having difficulty uh, difficulties conceiving. So in their time, in their lives, what they would do is help other women who were help other women who were able to conceive um, by having by having those children and being with those women throughout the birthing process but pharaoh told these midwives to do something that was in opposition of god's command now you may say well cameron how do you know it was an opposition of god's command well the scripture tells us here but because the midwives fear god so much they refused to obey the king orders i want you to realize that the midwives here they had a choice here's what was on the line what was on the line was their job Possibly their lives, but most of all, their, but, but, but of course their jobs were on the line or being in opposition with the one and true living God. 
Now they had a choice. They can go forward and obey Pharaoh, a man who commanded them to go out and kill every Hebrew boy because he, he was threatened. Or what they could do is go out and help each and every one of these Hebrew women, Hebrew mothers, have the safest delivery possible. And right here, these midwives, what did they do? They chose to help the babies. They chose to let the baby boys live. Every Hebrew boy, they chose to let them live. Why did they do that, Cameron? That is because they feared God that much. What is the significance of this story? I want you all to know something that today when abortion is just so easily thrown out there, when it seems as if it's nothing, when it seems like it's no big deal, that is why we have to talk about it. When it's so sensitive and people try to avoid it, with abortion being um, so so very well known today, but spoken of very little, it is important that we know that the, the amount of fear that society today has in God and going forward, it, it, it tends to decrease a little bit. People are doing things, they're making decisions without thinking about the future consequences, without thinking about how they're going to be in opposition with God. But I want us, I want you, if you're a young lady watching this today, you may be the father of a young lady who is contemplating abortion. I want you to watch this today. And I want you to go, you know what? This may be uncomfortable. And this may be tough. But we're going to push through this. We're going to have this baby. We're going to do what's right in God's eyes because children are innocent in God's eyes. That's another scripture I'm going to share later on today. But there's other scriptures that I want to reference here in relating to obeying God or obeying man. So if we go to Acts chapter 4, verses 19. And the reason I'm sharing this is because we all know recently that um, the Supreme Court, they legalize abortion and do all of that. I'm not here to really bash our uh, government, whether I agree or disagree with um, their rulings. I am simply stating here what God's word says and how we are to live as men and women of God. So if you go to Acts chapter 4, verses 19, again, as Acts chapter 4, verses 19, it says, But Peter and John replied, Do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? I bet you that is what those Hebrew, that is what those Egyptian women thought, the women who were the midwives. I bet you that's what they thought. They probably thought, or should we obey Pharaoh? Like, we're afraid of him a little bit, but we're, now, we're nowhere near afraid of him to the level that we're afraid of God. How afraid of you are God? You may say, I'm afraid, Cameron, because I don't know how I'm going to care for this child. I don't know how I'm going to provide for this child. I don't know what my family is going to do or what they're going to think or what they're going to say. But you must ask yourself, you must... Look into your heart and go, but do I fear God? What will God want me to do? I I know you may be watching today and you may be going, this dude has no idea what it's like to be pregnant. He has no idea what it's like to, to bear a child. He has no idea what it's like to have a child out of wedlock, to have a child at the age of 15, 16, or 17. He has no idea. So what gives him the right to speak on this? And you're absolutely right if you're thinking that I don't know what it's like. But I am simply reminding you that it is important that we obey God and his command before we obey the commands of man. Because the commands of man are only temporary, but God's commands are eternal. God did not want those children to be to be slaughtered. He put such a heavy conviction on those midwives' hearts that they couldn't even do what we would recognize as their CEO, their president. They couldn't even do what he asked them to do. So again, it is more important to obey God rather than than man. You may be a young lady today Kind of wondering, what am I supposed to do? Cameron, I got pregnant and I didn't plan on it. Cameron, what am I supposed to do? I'm in high school. I'm getting ready to graduate next year. 
I have a full ride scholarship to this college. Cameron, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to be getting married next year. I planned on going to med school. I planned on going to law school. I planned on doing these things before even starting a family. But this is why I want to bring you to Luke chapter 1, verse 26. And Luke wrote, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, greetings, favorite woman of the Lord is with you. There's somebody watching this video today, You're a young lady watching this today. And it may sound crazy if I were to tell you that you are favored in the Lord's eyes. That God is with you. I know Satan may be putting all of these thoughts in your mind. You're contemplating aborting the child that is in your belly right now, that is in your womb. You don't know how you're going to provide for this child. Here it is, Mary was the reason why I emphasized engaged to be married to a man. And this angel comes to her and says, you're going to carry the child. You're going to, you're going to carry the son of God. And if I were to read a little bit further, you would see that she was confused and disturbed. Because here it is that she's a virgin. It makes sense. How am I going to be pregnant and will this even look right? I'm a virgin. I'm, I'm, I'm engaged to be married to Joseph. And you're telling me I'm going to walk around pregnant. I'm going to get married. I'm going to get married pregnant. Um, back in that time, if that happened, most women were getting stoned to death because they were fornicating. They had a child out of wedlock. And that is where sometimes we get the term, the term bastard from. Um, but anyways... Here it is, Mary. She had her life's plan. They had a plan, and that was to get married. And this angel comes and tells her that she's going to be pregnant. She's going to be carrying the Son of God. Now, I know you may respond and go, Cameron, an angel didn't come and tell me I was going to get pregnant. God himself, did. the Holy Spirit didn't impregnate me. That is a totally different situation that is not relevant to me. And that is true. It may, you may not be able to relate 100% to Mary but emotionally, mentally, you can relate to Mary. I want to explain to you why you can relate to Mary. You can relate to Mary because Mary had a plan. Mary was getting ready to get married. Whether it was whether her wedding was three months out, four months out, a year out, she had a plan to get married. You may have a plan. You may be 15 or 16. Your plan is to graduate high school in two years. In two years, you're going to be graduating high school. And after that, you may have planned to go to college. And from college, you may have either planned to go ahead and enter the workforce and, and start your career. You may have planned on going to grad school to further yourself, to further your education. You may have, you may have planned to go to law school, medical school. Maybe you say, Cameron, before I even had a family, I wanted to be a businesswoman. Before I had a family, I wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a nurse. I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to do these things. I wanted to travel. You had these plans in place. And because of the act that you took part in, it now resulted in you being pregnant. And you're sitting here at a place where you're confused. And that's why I said Satan may be speaking to you. Ah, you got these things going on for you. Ah, you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to do that. You got all this going on for you. That baby is going to mess it all up. That baby is going gonna, is gonna to do this and it's going to do that. Do you not think that at some point in time through all of this, that Mary, that, that Mary, you do not think at some point in time Mary was like, should I go forward with this? Should I accept this child that God is going to put inside of me? How is this going to look? How is this going to affect the rest of my life? And I want to tell you right now, ignore Satan. Close your ears to him. Rebuke him and tell him to get away from you. Because that child is a blessing to you. A woman who has a child, I want you to know, even though today we may not praise it as much as they did back then, it is truly a blessing to be able to have a child. 
It is truly a blessing to be able to conceive and to say that you have a young one, you have a little one who you're going to have the opportunity to nurture, who you're going to be able to see grow up in wisdom and stature. It is a blessing. I understand that you had these plans and I understand that maybe the maybe you may have had these plans, but you didn't see this coming. But that's why I started off with Psalm 139. Before we were even in the womb, every single day of our life was already written out. It was a shock to you, but it was not a shock to God. It was a shock to you, but it was not a shock to God. I don't want to keep, I don't want to hold you all too long, so I'm going to keep uh, going forward here. I want to go to Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 11, verse 5. Again, that is Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 5. And it says, Just as you cannot understand the path of the wind or the mystery of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb. I love how Ecclesiastes Solomon started off with this. We cannot understand, no matter how much science, no matter how many degrees, no matter how many years one spends studying um, the development cycle of a child inside of a Inside of a woman's womb, we cannot understand the mystery and the activity of God who does all things. A lot of abortions take place today, and I know there are many reasons for the abortions. I, again, I am specifically focusing on those individuals, on the women who are contemplating, who are thinking about abortion because they weren't ready, they, they feel like they're not ready to be a mother. They feel like they're not at a financial place to be a mother. This may not have been the way they planned their life to go. They're thinking that if I abort this baby, everything will be better. If I get rid of this baby, everything will be easy. If I get rid of this baby, the way that I had planned life will go just as I had planned even though I got pregnant, I'm going to get rid of this baby and I'm going to keep going forward. But you cannot understand the activity of the things that God does. I want to reiterate that we cannot understand the activity that God does. It is important that we don't allow our impartial human knowledge our impartial thinking, as Paul said in 1 Corinthians um, chapter 13, verse 9. He said our knowledge, it's impartial, it's incomplete. We can't understand it, but because we can't understand it doesn't mean that we have to abort it. Let me step away from the baby part for a little bit. Maybe there's someone who has a who has a vision. Maybe your vision is a baby. Maybe you plan on starting this business. Maybe you're building a house. Maybe you're trying to build a law firm. Maybe you're trying to you're trying to build some business. And because you don't understand it, because you, it's a struggle, because things didn't go as you had planned. You now want to abort it. How do you think that's going to make you feel 10 or 15 years from now? You may turn back. You may go do something else. You may go work in your 9 to 5. Nothing wrong with working a 9 to 5, but I'm speaking to people who know that God has given them a vision. God is telling them, I need you to build this up for me because this is what I've called you to do. What do you do? How does it make you feel when you see that you aborted the plan in which God had for you. You aborted the vision that he gave you. How do you think that's gonna make you feel? We cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. We are not God. There is only one God, one God. We are not God. So if I'm speaking to the young lady that is watching this video today, you may be confused, you may be afraid, you may think it's impossible, but I want you to know, God is with you. You may not understand. You may go, Cameron, you, you just don't get it. It's so easy for you to say. And while it is easy for me to sit in this seat and maybe profess this word to you, 
it took a few days for me to learn how to say this to you, for God to show me these scriptures, to reveal to me exactly what it is he wants you to hear. In John 3, 8, Jesus said, we don't know where the wind blows. We don't know where the wind ends up and what direction it's going. Just as you don't know, just as you didn't know that you were going to be pregnant at this age and stage in your life. And I may be speaking to mostly those of you who are in your 20s right now. Which is why I keep think which is why I keep speaking about college, which is why I keep speaking about careers. That is a decade in our 20s where everyone, both men and women, they're trying to figure out everything they want to do with their lives. They're discovering what they were purposed to do, what God has called them to do. And the last thing that what's on a lot of people's mind is children. When you're trying to figure out what it is you want to do with your life, a lot of people, they're not thinking about kids. So when the child comes along, you see the child as a disruption. You see the child as an interruption, but God sees that child as a blessing. God sees that child as a blessing. So what happens when nations, like whether it's the U.S., the U.K., the U.N., the uh, Asia, Africa, wherever. What happens when nations are so laid back? They, they, they just encourage people to go forward with abortions. They try to encourage you, hey, go forward with it. We get it. You want to go to college. You want to do your career. Like I said, that is of Satan. I'm not afraid to stand here and tell you all that that is Satan himself speaking. In history, when you read the Bible and just all throughout history alone, but if we're speaking from the Bible, every time something significant was about to happen, every time an amazing prophet was about to come or something drastically, something spiritually was getting ready to take place, what did Satan try to do? He wanted to kill the babies. Before Moses, before Moses, was able to lead the people out of, out of Egypt. What happened? See, Satan wanted to keep the people there. He wanted them to be in bondage. He wanted them to just go through the struggle, to not listen to God, to not hear for God, to not hear from God, to not experience God anymore. So what did he do? Satan, I'm pretty sure, something, something, he got a hint somewhere along the line. We got to kill these babies. There's a child that was born that I don't quite feel good about. And he's going to disturb my plan. That's Satan. So what did he do? He got in Pharaoh's heart and he instructed Pharaoh, I need you to kill every single Hebrew child, every single Hebrew boy. On the surface, we see that Pharaoh was threatened by their numbers. But if we look at it spiritually, there was going to be a drastic change. There was going to be a drastic shift. Moses was going to bring the people out, out of Egypt. Imagine if Moses would have been one of those babies killed along the way. Today, would we still be in Egypt in slavery? Would we be, would you and I be conversating today? I don't know. If Herod would have gotten to Jesus, let's just say Joseph and Mary would have been hard-headed and didn't leave when the angel instructed them to leave. And those, and those soldiers came by and just killing every young boy who's two and younger. Imagine if they would have gotten to Jesus. Would we have the salvation that we have today? No. I want you to think about that. Those of you who are contemplating, I need to get rid of this child. Why am I having this child? What is the significance? God, why did this happen to me? Your child is blessed. You are blessed. Your child is going to be a world changer. I know right now it's scary, but later on it will make sense. So I'm going to get back to the question. What happens when a nation is just cool? with just killing these innocent children. Because remember, babies are innocent in the eyes of God. What happens? I'm gonna take you to Psalms 10, Psalm 106, 
chapter 106, verse 37 through 39. Again, that is Psalms chapter 106, verses 37 through 39. Verses 37 to 39, I apologize. I'm trying to get there myself. And it says, They even sacrificed their sons and their daughters to the demons. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters. By sacrificing them to the idols of Canaan, they polluted the land with murder. They defiled themselves by their evil deeds, and their love of idols was adultery, in the Lord's sight. Now verse 40 says, that is why the Lord's anger burned against his people. When we are comfortable with killing innocent human beings, born or unborn, in the womb, outside the womb, embryo or fetus, fetus or infant, when we kill these innocent human beings, we are making God angry. I don't have a big word to use for you. I don't have anything complex to say. I'm just going to keep it as simple as possible. We make God angry. The nation, we as a people, we make God angry. If we go to Joel, I want you to go to Joel chapter 3 verses 19. Joel chapter 3, verse 19. And the Bible says, But Egypt will become a wasteland, and Edom will become a wilderness, because they attacked the people of Judah and killed innocent people in their land. The economy will become a wasteland if we continue to kill, if we continue to do these things that are in opposition to God, the nation, whether it's the U.S., whether it's, it's Great Britain, whether it's the U.K., whether it's China, wherever it may be, if we just excuse this, if we just turn our head, if we just keep going, you know what, this is cool to go, it will become a wilderness because we are killing the innocent people, the innocent babies who didn't ask to be here. We're killing these innocent babies. I want to go to a question that I know is probably raising up in a lot of your minds right now. You may be saying, Cameron, what about those who are raped? It's a fair question. What about those who were raped by their dad, raped by their brother? Because it happened in the Bible. Those who were raped by a man on the street. What about a young lady who was in her room studying for an exam and some young man broke in and just raped her, took advantage of her? Are you telling this young lady to have this child who, who doesn't quite, who, who will remind her, I apologize, who will remind her of the pain and the agony she went through while that gentleman, while that man not gentlemen, while that evil man, while that evil man raped her, while that evil man violated her. What about that, Cameron? I want to take you to Romans chapter 8, verses 28. And some of you may say, well, that's the cliche thing to say, but it's also the truth. It's the word of God. In Romans 8, chapter 28 says, And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. If you've been raped and you're pregnant right now and you're watching this, I want to say that I am sorry for the pain that you went through. I'm sorry for the evil that was done to you. I'm sorry for the trauma that that evil man, that that disgusting man has caused you. But God has not forsaken you. I'm sorry for the daily reminder you may be pregnant. And I'm sorry that your mind, every time you look at, every time you look at your belly, every time you feel a kick, your mind may just replay 
that terrible day that you were violated. From the bottom of my heart, I want to say that I am sorry for that traumatic experience. And a lot of people may say, you have no place, you have no right to speak on this if a woman has been raped. And that is true. But I also want to say, just think about the child. Think about the baby. Think about the baby. If that baby is going to be a reminder to you as they grow up, if you feel like you're not ever going to be able to get past the rape because of that baby, because of looking at that baby, there are so many other options, and the best one is adoption. Have the baby in adoption. I'm, I'm, guys, I'm just honestly trying to explain things in the best way that I believe God wants it to, to be explained. And that is most likely the best way to go. I know you feel shamed, you feel violated. But I've heard so many testimonies. I've seen so many women, spoken to women, who were raped, found out they were pregnant, got an abortion, and the traumatic experience just kept going on. But it, it almost like doubled because... Not only are they thinking about the night in which they were raped, but they're also thinking about the baby that they aborted. The question may come up, how would that child have grown up to be? What would that child have done in their lives? Some of you may say, Cameron, you don't know what that child's going to be like its father. But if you're watching this today, are you like your father? If you're desiring to be a better person, a better man of God, a better woman of God, are you like your dad? Are you like your mom? The mistakes that they make don't necessarily mean though we will make those same mistakes. Think about that. And the last scripture that I want to share is 1 uh, Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. And Paul wrote to Timothy, but women will be saved through childbearing, assuming they continue to live in faith, love, holiness, and modesty. You may be a victim of rape. You may be a victim of molestation. You may be a victim of sexual abuse. I want to encourage you to keep on living in faith, keep on living in love, keep on being holy and keep on leaving modest. Just as God saw the people in Israel and the brutality that they went through, God sees you. I know I'm a man and this is a tough topic to talk about. And it may be a better place for a woman like maybe my wife to even speak about it. But I want to continue I want to encourage every single young woman watching this today. Live in faith, live in love, live in holiness, live modestly. Live for God. To close out this video, I simply want to say that if you're a young woman watching this today, maybe you're going, you're, you're, you're contemplating the, to having an abortion. You're saying, camera, I don't know if I can do this. You're thinking about a career, you're thinking about school. Maybe your parents are pressuring you to have an abortion because of the shame. Do you know that that happened in the Bible too? There were young women who were pressured to not have the child because of the shame that would be brought, brought upon on their families. Remember when I talked about the two women, the two midwives, and how they obey God over man. Tonight, today, this year, this time, while you're pregnant, you have a choice to make. You can choose to obey God and do things God's way. Or you can choose to obey man. And I am not preaching a message of one disobeying their parents. But I am simply stating that. If you know aborting that child goes against the will of God, if you know aborting that child is in opposition of what, will God, of what God would want, 
be obedient to God. It may be uncomfortable. Your parents may think you're crazy. Your guardians may think you're crazy. Your friends may go, what are you doing? Your life is going to be ruined. It's not. You may go through some difficult seasons. And I want to encourage, I want to want you to know right now, planned or unplanned, we all go through difficult seasons when we have kids. But that, that, that goes with it either way. But do what God would want you to do. Maybe you're a young lady today and you go, Cameron, I previously had an abortion. My parents pressured me and I fell into that pressure. I did it privately. Nobody knows. Cameron, I previously had an abortion. And I don't know if I can forgive myself. I want you to know that God forgives you. You can ask for forgiveness right now. You're not disgusting in God's eyes. You're not, you know, your life isn't over. You made a mistake as we all do. Your mistake is no greater than anyone else's. You have the opportunity right now to ask God for forgiveness. I know right now I'm speaking to someone. I'm speaking to a young teenager. I don't know why I see a young teenager in my mind and she's sitting on a bed. Her legs are crossed and she's crying. Her head is down and you're contemplating abortion right now. I pray that my voice right now, that God speaks through me and ultimately he speaks to you and you go forward and you have the baby. You stay strong. You press through. You ride it out. It may be difficult. It may be scary. But God is going to be with you each and every step of the way. You may be feeling shameful. You may be saying, I should have never even taken, I should have never even had sex. I should have never, I just should have never done the things that I did. God forgives you. God loves you. He wants your heart. We all make mistakes. I make mistakes every day. So I want you today, this tough word, this strong word, this topic, abortion, that's so scary. Stay away from it. We can talk about it, but I don't want you to take part in it. For the sake of your mind, do what God would want you to do. Do what God would want you to do. And on the scriptures that I've shared here, God will want you to have that baby. It may not make sense. I've said that over and over. But God would want you to have that baby. So I think we should end this video in prayer tonight, praying for all the young women out there, both who either have had an abortion or are thinking about an abortion, or you may be someone who is watching this today and you were, you were born and you were a child, you were once a child whose parents thought about aborting you. So if I can just pray for you right now, Heavenly Father, I pray that you touch the minds, you touch the hearts of every single young woman who is watching this video right now. This, there's a young woman watching this right now, oh Lord, who may have become pregnant unexpectedly. She may be living with her parents and she's afraid. She may be going to school. She may be planning her career. But Lord, I just pray I pray that you help that young lady. I pray that you help that young lady. You touch her mind. You touch her heart. You give her peace. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. God loves you. I love you. Um, drop a comment in the comment section. Uh... And again, if you have any questions, 
I'm still praying about it. I believe we should probably do a Zoom call. I think this is a topic that um, would even be better if there's conversations taking place. Like I said, there's a lot that I can still learn. Um, but it's a conversation that had to be had. And I said it at the beginning, this series, is it a sin? It's going to be tough. We're going to have tough conversations. So I love you all. God bless you. Any young lady watching this, I just pray that my voice encouraged you to do the right thing, the godly thing. Don't fall into the ways of man. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Do what God would want you to do. I love you. I love you. God loves you. You're loved. You're treasured. You're favored. Have a blessed night.